Welcome to Abortion in the Hills. I'm James Warner, co-founder of Silicon Hills Wealth Management here in Austin, Texas. And our special guest on today's podcast is Kelly Walter. Kelly's an award-winning chief marketing officer and served as CMO of some of the largest and most well-known brands in our industry. Recently, Kelly decided to leave the executive suite and trade the CMO title for another ambitious role, the role of founder. Kelly is the founder of Intentionally. Intentionally is a cutting edge marketing and brand building firm using modern marketing concepts to help accelerate growth for already innovative fintech firms. Kelly joins us today to share her story, to talk modern marketing, to discuss building a marketing team from the ground up, and how businesses of the future will need to integrate their people and their technology to build both brand awareness and to ultimately attract the clients and customers of tomorrow. So let's talk the future of marketing with Kelly Waltrick. James Warner is the founding partner of Silicon Hills Wealth Management and the host of A Voice from the Hills podcast. All opinions expressed by James, his co-host, and his guest are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Silicon Hills Wealth Management. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of Silicon Hills Wealth Management may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast. Hi, Kelly, and welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you so much for having me. How are you? Oh, man, I'm doing great. It's so great to have you on the podcast. It's uh, it's quite a treat. You guys have got a lot of stuff going on these days, don't you? Yeah. Yes, we do. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be able to catch up with you, even if it's formally over a podcast. <laughs> yeah, well, whatever whatever it takes, right? <laughs> yeah. That's the digital world we live in. So, I mean, we've all heard the concept of the elevator pitch, and you've got one of the better elevator stories I, I've ever heard. So yeah. let's turn the clock back a bit and have you share that story with us, because that's kind of where your career started to take off. Yeah, absolutely. I had landed in financial services. I had roles all throughout financial services, but it truly was an elevator pitch that that got me to where I am. Um, I was interviewing for a job at eMoney. I got an elevator. I didn't know that Edmund was the CEO. I didn't know who he was. I struck up a conversation with him. And by the time we got to the floor we were going to, um, I went to my interview. All of a sudden he came in, he took me out of the interview and he said, you're not going to do that job. You're going to work for me. And the rest is history. So I owe a lot to Edmund for my career um, and one of the crazier moments in my life. Um, but looking back, uh, it was one of the best decisions that I made. Yeah, that's that's a classic Edmund story, too. I could totally <laughs> see him doing that. Yes, for sure. And so you start out as director of communications and a little over a year later, you're CMO and pretty fast growing company, fast environment. Take us back. I mean, when you started, what, what was your mindset? And did you even have an idea that the CMO role was in the, was in the offing for you when you just started? You know what? No, I didn't go in thinking that. Um, I went in working for a phenomenal CMO who I'm still friends with today. Um, but my role at the time as director of communications was how do we How do we find the messages that resonate best with the audiences that we're trying to get in front of? And if you think about it, that truly is the basis of a great marketing organization that sort of drives everything. So spend some time figuring out the best ways to message e-money, how to get in front of the right audiences, how to get advisors to take action, how to get them to become brand advocates, how to get them to believe in what we were doing. And so the transition into CMO then became, how do we then get that audience to, to, to become clients? And it was a very natural, very natural segue by the time it happened. And in that particular case, and this is not just true of the financial services industry, I mean, this is true in a lot of different places, but your actual customers have customers. Right. And so your customers are the advisors, their customers are, are giving them feedback how do you put together an organization or a game plan that focuses not only on your customer, but on their end customer? That's such a good question. And you know what? I think that that's what we did really well at eMoney and why we had such an army of brand advocates at the time is because we got really good at arming all of our advisors with better ways to communicate financial planning to their clients. And you have to remember the days where we had um, videos that were voiced by Diane Lane and Kiefer Sutherland and 
a whole slew of other celebrities. Um, we really did try to put resources in the hands of advisors that they can then use to have better conversations with clients. And, it, and I think it went a long way. I mean, financial planning can be a complex topic and advisors not only have to be good at doing it, but then also explaining it. So we try, we, we tried to help with both. Yeah. I still remember the life as a box one. That <laughs> Life in a box. Yes. That 20, was years, definitely... 20 years later, I still remember it. So <laughs> that, must, that must be really good marketing. Yes. And I will tell you, it was not a problem for me to go to LA and do the recording with Rob Lowe when we did that one. So that was another highlight of my time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I don't, I don't guess you got any hazard pay on that deal. No, no, I didn't. <laughs> so if someone just landed in the role of CEO or maybe they're considering it uh, and they're just thinking through what their options are, when you think about company and culture, yeah. uh, what kind of company culture would you like to see in place? How does a, how does a corporate culture set a future CMO up for success? That's a really good question. And honestly, what I would say is that you want to look for a leader of an organization who really believes in the value of marketing, who believes that it should have a seat at the table, who believes that it can be a true driver of the company, not just of of culture, but of message of product of revenue. Um, so you really need to look for the right CEO. Um, and they can't just believe in it. They have to also have to put their money where their mouth is. They need to be able to budget appropriately for the role, results that they're hoping to gain. Um, so I think that the leader is one of the most important things, looking for the right CEO. Beyond that, you have to believe in the product. You have to believe in the tool and the value that it brings to the consumer um, in this case, in my career, to the advisor. And then the third thing I would say is you want to look for products and companies that have an army of advocates. If you look at my career, I went to eMoney and then I made a jump to Orion very intentionally. I looked for companies with leaders who believed in marketing, who were willing to budget for it. I looked for products that were solidly built. And I looked for companies that had brand advocates in their users so that they, the word of mouth would be um, a way to amplify the marketing that I was doing internally. And so you've been at the forefront of uh, some successful rebrands, acquisitions, uh, yeah. product launches, the whole nine yards. And really you've been in charge of building the teams to help execute those strategies. Take us through what a successful team build looks like. Oh my. Okay. So at both eMoney and Orion, I had teams of about 35 people, but in both cases, I started with one. Um, so I always tell aspiring CMOs or CMOs who have just taken the role that they need to prove the value as quickly as possible. So you need to be able to advocate for the budget you need to be successful. And the best way to do that is to focus on ways to catalyze revenue, ways to catalyze opportunities, um, and ways to help your sales team. And I think that that's counterintuitive in most cases. Most CMOs go in and say, oh my gosh, we need to redo your brand. We need to redo your messaging. We need to redo this. We need to focus on that. We need a new website. But to me, if you can go in and you can show that you can be a real partner in driving opportunities to your business, then you are able to get the budget to do all those other things much more easily. So I always say, start with your revenue driving efforts. So think about your lead gen, um, think about your digital, think about your social, um, all of those types of things. And your data is really important as well. So I sort of think that I start at the end of where most others start, but in my mind, it's about proving that the value is there and that the budget is worthwhile. Yeah, so you're selling the concept actually to the ultimate decision makers who are going to be handling that checkbook every year, and you're doing yeah. the hard thing first. Yeah, I mean, your your relationship with your CFO is actually probably the most important one you have. I mean, you need to be really close to your, your sale head of sales, but at the end of the day, you need to make sure that your CFO understands that there's going to be a return on the dollars you spend. And so getting your data platform set up really early on to be able to show that and to be able to drive opportunities quickly 
um, and at a and at a decent price point is really important. Yeah, and you need a and you need a leadership team that gets that. Yes, so I can, I can, I can see sure. how those two things definitely have to have to coexist. So yes. this is a good time to talk specifically about your latest venture intentionally. Yes. I love the name, by the way. Thank you. Uh, so what made it, what motivated you to make the transition from executive to founder? And tell us what you and co-founder Megan, what, what's your vision for the company? Oh my, thank you. Thank you for asking. Um, you know, the, the pandemic hit and Orion had just gone through a massive slew of acquisitions. As you know, um, I had just had my first baby and I asked myself if I could be doing anything right now, what would it be? And I had always wanted to start my own firm. And I had had the benefit then of watching Eric, watching Eric Clark is like a masterclass in running a business. I have to tell you, if you get to watch anybody, it should be him. Um, so it was really kind of, he kind of also inspired it. Um, which if I told him that he probably wouldn't be thrilled, but, um, so I just, <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to bring, it may be more- too soon. It may be too soon. Yeah. Um, I wanted to bring more modern marketing to more firms. I think that, you know, there's lots of advisory firms, asset managers, you name it, that need marketing support um, for a lot of reasons. One, it's really hard to build a marketing organization with all the diverse skill sets you need to make it work. If you think about it, you need somebody in digital, you need somebody in social, you need somebody in content, you need somebody in design. And that's just the start of it um, to be effective. So for a lot of firms, that's just not feasible. And then if you layer on the fact that you need industry context, because this industry is so nuanced, and the fact that it's hard to find good talent, I just decided it was a really good time to provide an outsourced marketing model to firms where they get access to all of those skill sets at once with folks who understand this industry inside and out um, and at a price point that is reasonable enough that we can show value quickly, like I said, and prove that the dollars are worth spending. So let's talk about, let's back up and talk about modern marketing for a second. Yeah. Why don't you define it for us? How would you define it if you just had to put it into a short uh, definition? Yeah, I think there's two components of it. I think the first are the tactics. I think modern marketing is um, leans towards more digital tactics, but also more omni-channel efforts. And then from a more overarching perspective, I define modern marketing as being responsible for generating revenue. I think this industry is so stuck in the past in terms of, oh, marketing makes our pitch books and our brochures. Whereas I, you know, maybe it's because I come from a SaaS background, but I I like to make sure that there is a really strong correlation between the efforts of the marketing organization and the growth of the company. And and would it be fair to say that modern marketing is more customer focused and less outwardly product focused or is that is that not what you would or would you disagree with that no i think i think you're spot on i think there's definitely a shift especially in our industry sort of a realization that the old way of trying to sound so overly smart and sophisticated is not resonating and that we need to be human and talk to investors like they're real people um, and simplify things for them and be conversational and casual in the way that we're approaching our marketing with them. So I definitely think you're spot on in terms of there's been a, a, a shift. It needs to still continue to happen, but there's definitely been a shift towards a more human approach to messaging. And how important is receiving feedback throughout the process? Uh, Everything. When, when, do you, when do you ask for it? And how do you decide what to take seriously and what might just be noise? Yeah, that's a great question, too. I We let the data make decisions for us. I think that marketing is such a mix of creativity and analytics. Um, you have to be really creative in your approach, but you have to let the analytics tell you if it's working or not. So we try to make sure that everything we do to the extent possible is measurable so that we can quickly pivot um, quickly evolve, quickly adjust if what we're doing isn't working. So so honestly, the answer to your question would be just to be staying on top of the data and the right data. You know, there's a million data points that you can look at when it comes to marketing. So honing in on what are the data points that are going to tell you the most about how successful your programs are, are doing. 
And, and you talk a little bit about uh, getting out of your comfort zone and, and developing a new playbook, I think, instead of what you just were referencing, you know, kind of repack, repackaging the same old playbook. Yeah. What does that new playbook look like? And how does the concept of modern marketing transform it? Not just for financial advisors, but for, you know, for businesses across the, across the landscape. Yeah. You know, I always tell organization my whole career, I've told organizations that I've either worked with and intentionally or firms that I've been the CMO at, or even firms that I've interviewed with that a good marketing leader or a good marketing function changes your whole entire business. It's making your product teams deliver things when they say they're going to deliver, um, that do what they say they're going to do. It makes your sales team accountable to converting the opportunities that are handed to them. It makes leaders, CEOs, accountable to being the thought leaders that the marketing team is saying that they're, they're being. So I really think that the right marketing leader at an organization, and this is, this is a big job to fill is essentially a catalyst for personal growth in the entire organization. And I think one of the things that you mentioned on your site uh, and intentionally is that, uh, that you want to help accelerate the growth plans for already innovative uh, FinTech firms. So that would, that would indicate to me that there is some sort of, uh, um, you know, there's some sort of choice being made, not only from the company choosing intentionally, but from intentionally choosing which companies they work with. Yeah. Is that true? And how does that shake out? Yeah, it's definitely true. Um, we've sort of made a promise to ourselves and intentionally that we are only going to work with clients, one who are kind, um, Two, who understand that marketing is not a silver bullet and that you're not going to send an email and get a million dollars in revenue. You'd be surprised how many clients we run into that that truly believe that's how it works. But most importantly, that they have a story. Um, we see, you know, 100 technologies a month that want help, you know, telling their story. We talk to a lot of advisory firms and we've gotten really good at identifying the ones who are truly trying to differentiate themselves, whether that be with their product, the service, their process, their client experience, whatever it is. We want to work with a firm who knows who they are and whether they can articulate it well or not, we can always help with that. But who has something interesting and differentiating about them? Because it's really hard to market a firm that doesn't have that. So if they if they don't have a story that that you can help them tell a little bit better, then that's uh, that's kind of a that's kind of a sign that maybe they don't have the right product or the right leadership team or the right uh, you know suite of services, whatever it might be. Um, when you run across that, I'm sure the a the company's probably surprised the because most companies feel like, I think we all feel like we have a, a unique nuanced story that, that resonates with people even when we don't. Yeah. So I'm sure there's a little bit of a shock and awe when you say, you know, there's no story there. Uh, yeah. How do, you, how do you send them down the road with a little bit of feedback that might help them get back on track? Yeah, you know, I actually run into this a lot and I try to be really kind about it, but we I have a lot of businesses come to me and say, you know, I am building this or I'm launching this or and I say to them, and I, I have the benefit of the role that I'm in and actually in the role that I was in at Orion too, to see the industry as a whole and know a lot of the different players. So I just kindly ask them, well, did you take a look at this technology or did you look at this company or how are you different from this company? And I just give them some... Um, a push in the right direction to go back and sort of reevaluate what they're saying in terms of being the first or the only or the best. Because a lot of times I find that leaders and founders have blinders on to what they're building and don't maybe see the bigger picture. So I do, you know, I just wrote my wealth management mid-year outlook or end of year outlook about this, that it's not the job of the marketing team to differentiate your business. You need to have a differentiated business that your marketing team can then promote. So I think that's the job of leadership teams is to figure out where do they fit into the broader landscape? How do they compare competitively? 
and then give that those insights to the marketing team to then be able to do what they do best. Wow, that's good advice. So now we met on the eMoney advisory board, I think, originally. We did. Uh, and, and you serve on your fair share of advisory boards. How, how does serving on an advisory board enhance your skill set and understanding of what you do? And, and how do you decide when to say yes and, and when to pass? Yeah, that's, uh, I think I, I think I could get better at that for sure. I absolutely love serving on, I love serving on advisory boards because it's such a good introduction to smart people with skill sets that I don't have. Um, so I love, I love being able to collaborate with, with bright people. And, you know, as an entrepreneur, it's been amazing for me to sit on some of these boards to see how other companies are run. You know, I've, I've been a marketer my whole life, been a CMO my whole life. So going from that to entrepreneur is definitely, there's definitely a learning curve. And so the ability to see sort of the inner workings of how companies are running their businesses, running their boards, thinking about, you know, the order of the things that they put in place, the hiring processes, it's just been in really helpful to me in, in launching and, and running intentionally. And then you've mentioned something in a recent interview that kind of caught my attention. I think you said the goal of transforming, one of the goals you have is transforming corporate executives into thought leaders. Yeah. Uh, why is that meaningful? And do you have a template for that that I could steal or is it? Uh... <laughs> well, I think, you know, Eric Clark is such a good example of this. You know, I got to Orion and Edmund too, really, you know, I got to both of these organizations and they both had phenomenal leaders who were super innovative, super interesting, thought about things in in really unique ways and in and in ways that could benefit the broader industry. So, I think, you know, I I took it upon myself in both instances to try to make sure that their voices were heard. And I think in the those two use cases it was hugely beneficial to those organizations because I advisors, I mean, you can you can tell me I'm right or I'm wrong, but I I think you want to know that there's somebody at the helm of the organizations of the tools that you're you're using that is thinking a step ahead, that is thinking about the things that you're not thinking about, that you don't have time to think about. And you want to know that somebody is, is out there on your behalf, um, ready for the next thing that's going to come down the pike. So I think making those two leaders, thought leaders, amongst many other executives of both of those firms, with those two come to mind as, as the two best examples. And so as somebody, it's hard to transform someone's personality. So knowing, knowing Edmund and Eric, I mean, yeah. you didn't have to transform their personalities. I mean, they're already, <laughs> uh, you know, they're already larger than life in their own, in their own way. Yeah. So in that way, you just have to kind of direct the public to see what you see. Yeah, or exactly. The audience to see what you see. What, what about, maybe a late bloomer uh, CEO or, or somebody who hasn't gotten out of their comfort zone or really ha doesn't have the same, maybe they're a great operator of the business uh, in their own right, but don't have that commanding personality. They don't have that yeah. you know, take over a room type thing that, that both Edmund and Eric have. Yeah. We have a client today who um, has been with us for a year and it has been a shocking transformation for him. And one that I am so excited about because he is one that was very uncomfortable, very uncomfortable on video, very uncomfortable articulating sort of his ideas, but he had them. He had a ton of amazing ideas and he was really good at tying this industry to pop culture, to history, to all kinds of interesting things that catch attention. Um, so I, our company, you know, our team at Intentionally has gone through an effort to turn this um, this leader of a small hybrid RAA into a, a thought leader that is driving recruitment to his firm at a unprecedented pace. And it's awesome to see because he's definitely someone who started at zero and has worked his way up to becoming a thought leader. Well, that's cool. I'm going to sign an NDA with you so you can give me that name I, off offline. I will. I would love to. It's such a it's such a good example. I I wish I could say his name, but I I don't know if he would he would appreciate that. But he's um, yeah. We have a couple of examples like that, but I think it's all it all comes down to having a point of view, right? Having something interesting to say, and so if you have that and you just 
aren't able to articulate it, then there's lots of companies, mine being one of them, that can help you take those ideas and turn them into something that will help drive audience to your firm. And what are some of the missteps that you see in that regard where, where you do have a where you do have a CEO that has those interesting qualities? They they do connect things that most people don't connect. They do have concepts that are interesting, but for whatever reason they're the way that they share it or who they share it with or how they incorporate that into their business just doesn't it, it just doesn't catch on. What what do you how how does that happen and why? You know, the biggest thing I see is people wanting to be overly promotional. I think people equate being promotional to driving results. And in reality, people want to relate to you. They want content that's interesting to them. They want content that they is usable and practical to them. And so I, I help a lot of firms. I'm working with one right now, focus their brand on being less me, 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 and being promotional and sort of flipping it and thinking about what can I provide my audience that is going to help them transform themselves or their business? Like, how do I provide them value? And so I think that the biggest mistake I see is being overly promotional in the way that you're messaging. And then I guess, uh, over, over Thanksgiving holidays, you guys were pretty busy. Uh, you acquired C-suite. Yeah. Uh, social media and got a new chief growth officer out of it, Tina Powell. Yeah. And believe it or not, I had never met Tina in person until just a few months ago. Ah. Uh, so that's the, uh, you know, see her everywhere, of course, but I'd never actually fit met her, met her in the flesh until I think we were at the Risk uh, uh conference together and finally got to meet her. So congratulations for, uh, uh, for that. You. I think you, you made reference to the synergy as electric. Yeah. And so how do you see that electricity translating to your clients? Yeah, that's, thanks for asking that. Um, bringing on Tina has been amazing. Um, we've known each other for a lot of years. And actually, as I was starting intentionally, Megan and I went to her and said, you know, this is something to think about teaming up with us. And she said, no, no, no. I, 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 what I'm doing is great. I love my company. And then we, I think we wore her down over time. <laughs> Um, but essentially she is phenomenal at growing audiences and growing communities. Um, and I think the future of marketing is owning your audience. If you take anything away from this podcast and this conversation with me, think about how your firm owns their audience. I think a lot of advisory firms, a lot of firms in our space, they rent their audiences. They go on other people's podcasts. They do advertising through other publications. They guest blog. They do all these things that essentially are driving traffic to other people's web properties. At the end of the day, the firms that win are going to be the ones that amass their own audience and who can use that audience in different ways, whether it be to upsell, cross-sell, um, whatever it is. So I think that the future of, of marketing is really owning your audience and Tina is a master at that. Well, and I think you've hit on an important theme because I, I think one of the reasons people are overly promotional is because they are renting their audience and they think I've only got the audience for a, a short period of time, better sell them while I got them. Right. Uh, and when you own the audience, then you really don't have to be promotional uh, because eventually they're going to come to you and say, okay, how would I, how would I buy what you have? Yes. Or maybe I need what you have. I'm not sure, but I, I think I do. And even in your case where, you know, you put the idea out to Tina initially and it was something she wasn't interested in. If you would have gone for a really hard sell at that moment, this probably doesn't happen, right? but when you leave it out there and over time it, it kind of takes on a life of its own and it becomes, uh, it becomes an acquisition that probably otherwise wouldn't happen. So I, I think that's a, a great lesson for people when, you know, there's nothing wrong with telling someone, you know, I've started this company, I admire what you're doing and I really think we should work together. Yeah. Uh, and just kind of leaving at that and see how that, you know, progresses over, over time. 
Yeah, I have a lot of advisory firms that call me and they say, you know, I've been sending this email newsletter for a couple months now, or I've been doing this for a couple months now, and it's not working. And, you know, the first thing that I say to them is it's not not working because there's a catalyst for financial services. People don't wake up in the morning and say, I need a financial advisor. Something happens in their life where they realize that, you know, their the management of their assets is beyond what they're capable of, or they have a life event. I mean, you know this, I'm preaching to the choir here, but people need you to be in front of them so that when they, one of those moments arise in their lives, that you're the first thing that they see. I mean, this is not overly complicated stuff. So I think I, you know, I have a lot of conversations about, I tried this and I tried that and I tried this and it's not working. At the end of the day, marketing is about being consistent and staying in front of your audience with messages that resonate with them. It's a pretty simple formula um, as long as you're talking to the right people. Well, and it's, and it's funny. I think every industry probably sees their own industry as a little more complex and a little more nuanced than it actually is. That's true. Yep. And at the end of the day, as a, as a marketer, you've probably seen hundreds of different companies and in multiple different industries. Yeah. Do you find they're all a little less complicated than they think they are? Yeah, I think you're right about that. And maybe it's not that their business isn't complicated, but it's that the marketing formula isn't complicated. And so you know, we'll I'll have a company come to me and say, oh, but you don't, you've never worked with an XYZ before. And I'll say <laughs> to them, you know, and I'll say to them, okay, that's fair. But what I know about growth in general and about growing the type of firm that you have is that you need to do X, Y, and Z. And the formula obviously shifts and changes a little bit. Um, but essentially, yeah, it's not, it's not as complicated as a lot of a lot of folks make it out to be. And so now you're, you're a wife, mother of two and yes. entrepreneur. Now you've got a lot of different roles and titles that are a uh, Phillies fan. Uh, <laughs> how does, how do all those experiences change you as a consumer? Yeah. And as you change as a consumer, does that change you and change how you view providing advice from the other side of that equation? It definitely has changed me as a leader. I will tell you that. Um, you know, I, I always say to my team here that um, Intentionally Kelly is definitely not Orion Kelly. I had no kids when I was at Orion. I ran 24 hours a day, had nothing else to worry about. Um, and now prioritization is the number one thing I have to worry about in my life. You have to be super efficient when you wear a lot of hats, right? Especially being a mom um, and having aging family members. So I think it's about using your time more wisely. So I don't think it's, I, I don't think it's that I get less done in a day. It's that I get the right things done because I have no other choice. <laughs> and, and as a consumer, I would say, yeah, I think that it's made me realize, not that I didn't already know this, but that having the attention of the consumer at the right moment when they're ready to make a decision is so important because people's lives are busy and they have a lot going on and everybody's wearing a lot of hats and you just never know what's going on in someone's lives. So, so being present at the moment that something they have a need is just that much more important now that I have this perspective. So if, if I had to rephrase that for you, you've got to own your audience and you've got to be there in that decision window with an actionable way for, for them to move forward. Exactly. You got it. And try not to be too pushy in the process. Exactly. I like it. I like it. So <laughs> let's, uh, let's put yourself in the mythical CMO chair again. And if yeah. I could only tell you, you're evaluating, taking a, uh, corporate executive role, marketing role with a, with a company, I can only give you three metrics of that company. I can tell you three things about it for sure. I can only tell you three, what three do you need to know to decide whether this is a good job to take? Um, I need to know your MPS score. Okay. I need to know. And let's translate that for the, uh, for the non-initiated yeah. audience, what is MPS? 
net NPS is a net promoter score. So it essentially net promoter tells, score. Okay. Yeah, it tells you the satisfaction of your clients. Um, okay. If you're evaluating a CMO role, you want to know that the clients that are using that product are happy um, and that you're not walking into a, a disaster. Um, I would want to know the if they most companies won't give you their you know all their financials right out of the gate, but I do usually ask what is the ratio of marketing budget to revenue. I think that's really important to understand that they're giving you, and it's not. You know, I'm not a believer in that marketing budget should be 1% or 10% or whatever. I think it totally depends on the business, but it will give you a sense of, you know, what resources do you have at your disposal? Um, And then I want to know what are the goals for the following year? So I want to know how happy are your clients? What are the goals for the following year? And do I have the resources to to get you to those goals? Wow, that's a good list. I like it. Hmm. Uh, All right. So final thing, let's get back to the elevator. Yeah. If you could take a ride up that elevator with your younger version of yourself, uh, what would you tell her? What advice would you give her? Oh, my gosh. I would say everything happens for a reason and enjoy the ride because I am really appreciative for that moment Um, and all of the ones after. I've had the, you know, I've been lucky enough to work at two amazing companies and now to be running my own and working with clients that I adore and teammates that I adore so I would say buckle up and enjoy the ride. Oh, I like it. I think you just came up with the uh, title of the podcast. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I don't have to, uh, I don't have to wordsmith that now. So. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, Kelly, thank you so much for joining us and spending a little time with us. Uh, best of luck on everything that you're doing with Intentionally. Thank you. I really appreciate you having me. And that's a wrap for this episode of A Voice from the Hills podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. And for access to this episode and all prior episodes, you can subscribe to A Voice from the Hills on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you access your podcast. You can follow A Voice from the Hills and Silicon Hills Wealth Management on social media to gain access to all of our content. And we've also rolled out a new mini pod called The Stream. The stream is going to highlight timely updates and information and introduce important ideas and concepts in short but impactful three-minute micropods. You can subscribe separately to the stream on all podcast platforms, and you can access the stream through any Alexa-enabled device by simply asking Alexa to play the latest update from Silicon Hills Wealth. If you'd like to learn more about Silicon Hills Wealth and the services we offer, please visit our website. And as always, we cannot thank you enough for engaging with us. We can only do our best work when you are here to listen.